Good morning. Welcome to Coastal Conversations. My name is Michael Chambers. I'm the Associate Vice President of Research at the University of South Alabama, and I'm honored to be asked to serve also as the Executive Director of Coastal Conversations, uh, which is an initiative of the Coastal Alabama Partnership, thanks to our partners and the leadership of Wiley Blankenship and Andrew LeVere at CAP. Uh, I want to thank our sponsors immediately, the Bedsole Foundation, the Crampton Trust, Fox 10 News, uh, Lanyap, as well as iHeartRadio and Mobile Rundown for pushing the word out about Coastal Conversations. So today we're releasing the results of the Coastal Community Dashboard. It was created by Dr. Reed Cummings and Yana Stepofsky here at the Mitchell College of Business. They're with the South Alabama Center for Business and Real Estate and Economic Development. And for obvious reasons, we call that SABRE. Uh, so you're gonna hear that term a lot. Uh, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Cummings and Ms. Stepofsky here shortly. Uh, but first, I want to uh, thank Dr. Alvin Williams, who's the Interim Dean of the Mitchell College of Business, for uh, helping sponsor this event today in this beautiful building. So just a word about uh, Dr. Williams. He, as I mentioned, is the interim dean, but he's no uh, stranger to USA or being a dean for that matter. Uh, I believe he's been at the Mitchell College of Business since 2008. Prior to that time, he was dean of the College of Business at the University of Southern Mississippi. He is not just the professor, but the distinguished professor, and that's quite obvious why, of uh, marketing and quantitative methods. He's, uh, his specialty, I believe, is supply chain management, which if you're in that sector, it's a very hot topic right now, and actually served as past editor of the Journal of Supply Chain Management. So Dr. Williams, would you like to say a few words? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to the Mitchell College of Business. We're very pleased to have you here today. This is a superb program. This might be labeled a watershed moment for our college. The quality of the information that all of us will realize from this dashboard will make a very big difference in the quality of life in the coastal area. And that's what we're all about. It's also a fantastic partnership between the Mitchell College of Business and the broader Mobile community. And that we like. Fundamentally, this dashboard will contribute to our mission, teaching, research, and service. We are in the process of developing a doctoral program in business analytics, and this dashboard will support that. As we improve our outreach initiatives, this dashboard will support that as well. So this is really a big, big deal. And we're very pleased to have you building today and we hope that this will lead to even bigger partnerships in the future. We welcome you back to the Mitchell College. We have opportunities for you to speak to classes, to do different things, to support our research. So don't let this be your last time in this building. Again, welcome. We're very pleased to have you. And we look forward to future contributions. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, I mentioned that this is a program of the Coastal Alabama Partnership, but whether you're here with us live today or you're uh, online listening to the live stream, many of you may be asking, what is Coastal Conversations? Uh, basically, we see ourselves as providing three key components, our mission to the community. Uh, the first is providing world-class speakers on key topics of interest. We've already done two of those. One was Dr. Ron Ferguson of Harvard, who talked about learning disparities a very well received program which is gaining momentum to perhaps bring the basics, a key program for uh, infants zero to three and their mothers to the Mobile area like in 45 other American cities. Second, we had Chuck Marone, who was one of the top 10 urban planners in the United States talk about what cities should invest in. Uh, so we've already had two speakers uh, here. The second thing, part of our mission, is a quality of life survey which we released last month uh, we engaged the polling firm of ALG in uh, Montgomery with offices nationwide. We polled 750 residents in Mobile and Baldwin County. The results of that poll are online for you to take a look at. We think it's important to know what people think about the key areas or key problems we have. I would encourage you to look at it because there's some differences, as you might imagine, between Mobile and Baldwin County. 
Uh, but today, we're delivering on the third aspect of our mission, and that is a community dashboard of free metrics. It's free. It will be available on the Coastal Alabama uh, CoastalCond.org website uh, shortly after this presentation for all of you to see the results. Now, the quality of life survey showed us what people think. What you're going to hear today are the facts, the data pulled many times from Mobile County, Baldwin County, state averages, federal averages when available. And you'll see that they are going to focus on, I believe, about six key areas of interest. But the whole dashboard uh, covers the economy, new jobs, capital investment, health care, uh, infant mortality, child mortality, obesity rates in our area, uh, education, uh, grade uh, reading by third grade level, the scores of math and science up through our systems, broken down by school systems, graduation rates, and poverty, people and children in our area living below the poverty line or re re uh, receiving a reduced or free lunch. So those are going to be available on our website as will be explained. But many of you have heard the story of Admiral William Stockdale, who's famous for something called the Stockdale Paradigm. And a key component of that paradigm, which is two parts, the second part was a ruthless assessment of our current situation. And so today, what you'll see is a ruthless assessment of our current situation. Some will be good and encouraging. Uh, some will not be that good. Uh, we believe, though, what gets measured gets improved. And that's a key component of why we're doing this. And I'd mentioned that these areas have been selected with input from many of you in the room about what we should be measuring. If you have additional metrics, whether you're here or online, Please tell us what you think should be included, and uh, we will certainly try to work on that. Um, so before I introduce our presenters, just a few key words about logistics. We expect this to last roughly 40 minutes with about uh, 15 to 20 minutes of Q&A. Uh, if you have a question, please hold it to the end of the presentation, and uh, we will pass the mic to you. Uh, we feel reasonably comfortable with uh, kind of the lifting of most of the COVID restrictions. If you don't feel comfortable with that, uh, just let us know and I will not give you the mic. Uh, but please don't shout out the answer, the question, even though we're in a relatively small environment here. We are taping and if you ask the question out there, no one will hear it. Conversely, if you're online on Facebook Live or the YouTube stream, use the comment or chat feature and we're monitoring both accounts and we will aggregate those questions, hopefully in an orderly fashion, and pass them along at the appropriate point to Dr. Cummings or Ms. Zupofsky. Uh, so, uh, a few final key points. They are here to present the data, the facts. Uh, they gathered and aggregated from respected sources. They are not here necessarily to defend those facts or the results or why they exist, uh, simply to explain the sources and how they came about. Uh, with this, this source material. So really what I'm telling you is these folks are the messengers. And you know what we always say about the messengers. Don't shoot the messengers because we need them in the future to update these metrics on a regular basis, <laughs> right? So uh, essentially what this gives us today is a benchmark in a lot of these areas. And so by establishing a ben benchmark, we see whether we make progress or we don't make progress. And that's how we start the conversation in these areas. So let me tell you a little bit about uh, Dr. Cummings. He's the Interim Assistant Dean for Finance here in the Mitchell College of Business. He's a professor of finance and real estate. Many of you probably know him already from his work in that area. And of course, he's Executive Director of, of SABRE. He was the Mitchell College of Business Professor of the Year a couple of years back. And he has over 30 years of providing impact analysis, market studies in real estate, construction, and many other areas. Uh, Ms. Stupofsky is actually an instructor in management here, and you may know that she's a PhD student in the brand new pro program, Business Analytics, which is here in the Mitchell College of Business. Uh, many of you may also know, I always want to say Jana instead of Ms. Stupofsky, from her work at the Mobile Area Chamber of Commerce and Mobile Airport Authority. If you look back on her work there, 
She was working on projects in aerospace, if that rings a bell. Uh, steel, if that rings a bell to any of you. Uh, paper and chemical. And so, so she obviously did a very good job in that role. And uh, on a personal note with Ms. Topofsky, I would tell you uh, an interesting thing about her is not only does she speak English, she speaks Czech and Croatian and German and Slovak and Swedish. So whenever we travel, we always want her around. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen who are listening, Dr. Reed Cummings and Ms. Janice Topofsky. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, good morning, and once again, as Dr. Williams uh, said earlier, we are so glad that you're here. We welcome you to the Mitchell College of Business, and as he also said, we hope it won't be your last visit if this is your first. Uh, so well, a month or so ago, actually more than a couple of months ago, early December, I got an email one day from Michael, and he said, hey, we're working on this thing. I didn't know what it was, Coastal Conversations, and he, and he, and he sent me an email with a flyer and said, this is what it's about. Can you recommend uh, a metric or two that we can feature uh, with respect to the real estate or the economy uh, aspects of our coastal region? Thought about it for a bit and I called him up and I said, Michael, we can certainly do that, but you know what? We would love to be involved in a larger project. How about uh, we get engaged with uh, this project and actually develop and produce uh, and report on the dashboards? And so that's how we got involved. We're very delighted to be a part of this and we appreciate the support that uh, Coastal Conversations and the Coastal Alabama Partnership have given us on this. So as, he, as uh, Michael said, uh, it's my pleasure to work with Yana Stopovsky. Um, when we interviewed her some years ago, we knew that she was the person that we wanted uh, to work with us and she's uh, been a pleasure to work with and she has developed a high level of expertise in developing these dashboards. And so as he said as well, data uh, are very interesting things. Data tell stories. Sometimes the stories are good, sometimes not, but the data don't lie. So what we've tried to do is we've tried to shape each of the dashboards with the data to support the answer to one specific question. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Yana and ask her to give you kind of a rundown on how the dashboards function. They're all the same in terms of the way they function and, 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 and so forth. So I'll ask her to do that. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is a general layout for each dashboard. At the very top, you'll see a title, typically a question that the dashboard tries to answer. And if you know nothing or very little about the subject that the dashboard int introduces, all you have to do is just read that little paragraph we typically include with each dashboard and you should be well informed about, about what we're looking at and why is it important. Uh, across the dashboards you'll see more one or multiple charts and um, this little icon here invites you to hover over those charts sometimes. Uh, there are pop-up windows that include additional information. Um, and then some uh, dashboards even have additional filters depending on how much data we were able to find, you're able to drill in. So for instance, with this one, and Dr. Cummings will cover this shortly, but you can drill into different industries looking at what the wages are uh, across uh, both counties. At the bottom, we typically list a source that links directly to the website where we pulled the data from. About data is when you hover over, there is additional information on methodology or calculations if you're interested in reading about that. And then, well, button here allows you to download the view that you, um, that you select. I think that's all as far as dashboard introduction. Right. Terrific. Let's go to the first one. And we, we chose a few to highlight um, certain, we don't have time to go through all of them. Uh, as my Michael said these, these are now live on your, dashboard, on, on your website, so you'll be able to see these yourselves. And we will, as data are refreshed uh, and supplied, we will have those continually updated for you. So they will be live, and, and they're very dynamic in the way they work. So let's look at wages first. Uh, so what you'll see here is, uh, and these trend lines over time, that Mobile County wages are just about uh, the same as Alabama, but a little bit less than the U.S., which you would expect because the U.S., given a larger population, including a lot more higher income areas, more dense urban areas, you would expect that trend. Um, you also will see that uh, wage trends in both counties are up over time. Again, you would expect that from increases in, in minimum wages and salary increases over time. But as Yana mentioned, we have the ability to drill into certain sectors of the economy. So I want to take a look at education. And those little two numbers to the left, these are two-digit North American Industry Classification Codes. You can look these up. It's very exciting stuff. Next codes and so forth is what they're called. But looking at education, this is important because we're going to feature an education dashboard later uh, and some of the news there isn't as good as we would like to expect. 
but you can see the wages in education are fairly low in both counties. That's unfortunate, but it is what it is. Let's look next at transportation equipment manufacturing. And so as everybody knows in our area, we produce airplanes and we produce ships. Wages are very high here in Mobile County for both of those areas. Let's drill in to chemical manufacturing, often overlooked, but a very strong component of our economy. Our friends at the chamber, uh, good morning, uh, will we'll verify that this is a very, very, very strong part of the economy in Mobile County, and a number of folks in Mobile and Baldwin counties work in these industries. Wages are extremely strong. Let's look at utilities, as you would expect, uh, you know, Alabama Power and, and Spire and Mobile Area Water and Sewer and some of the others here that provide our utilities and as well as the folks over in Baldwin County as well. Uh, utility work uh, is extremely strong. But the, the shining star, I think, for wages uh, in, in our area is really mining, quarrying. I don't know how much quarrying we do, but we do do a lot of oil and gas extraction out of the bay and so forth. And so if you look at these, the wages are incredibly strong and stronger in Mobile County than they are for the U.S. Uh, as a whole. So let's look next uh, at labor force, and I'll get Yana to illustrate that one for you. Labor force participation basically shows a uh, number of percentage of people a, between age 18 and 64 who are um, who choose to work. So basically, it's the in other words, out of all 18 to 64, 18 to 64 year olds in this region, the colored portion in the bar chart, these are the people that choose to work or are actively looking to work. Um, the key takeaway from this one is our two counties are consistent with, um, with the nation and with the state. Even um, the growth charts um, indicate similar growth in all the regions that we're looking at. If the difference uh, in our two counties was different compared to the state and the, in, the, in the nation, then maybe questions could be asked as to why. But as far as the data shows, we're pretty consistent. Roughly 60% of people aged 18 to 64 in both counties choose to work. Let's shift and go over to uh, health and welfare uh, items. And let's look at child mortality. So child mortality is defined as the number of deaths of children ages 1 through 18 per 100,000 people of population. And so what the dashboard shows you, uh, happily for us, is that the trends in both counties over the last 10 years are down. The trend in Baldwin County uh, is lower, so they're having fewer child mortality deaths than in Mobile County. But as Yana mentioned earlier, these dashboards sometimes have secondary components, and in this case, this one does. So I'd ask her now to choose the one that we've broken this down by race. And sometimes we don't have all the data, but the data we do have for uh, white and black uh, people is for the last three years. And what you see here is that in Mobile County, uh, the, the child mortality rate for black children is higher than for white, but it's largely unchanged over the last three years. The story's a little different in Baldwin County. Uh, in Baldwin County, um, the rates for blacks are trending down. In fact, there's a 30% decrease in child mortality over the last three years, and that's certainly good news regardless of race. But it's trending up for whites, 10% over the same time frame. I don't have an answer or an explanation. I have some theories uh, as to why that may be, and we can talk about that at some other time. But uh, this is something that we point out uh, because the data are there. And again, remember, these dashboards will be updated as new data come out, so it's important that you pay attention to these particular trends. Uh, over time. And I would just add that um, other races, data for other races were not available and really the data was only available for the past three years so we worked with what we've had but if there is more data available we'll certainly add it in later for comparison. So let's turn now, uh, turn now to crime. And we got this information from the Alabama Law Enforcement uh, Association. Each um, law uh, Law, law enforcement agency, sheriff's uh, offices, and police departments, and, and so forth, for each of the towns, cities, and municipalities, and counties, report their information to the ALEA, and we, we drew our data from them. Um, so uh, crime data is expressed on a per 100,000 people of population, and what you see is that Bowen County's rates are generally lower in, than in the U.S. and in Alabama. Uh, Mobile counties are higher, and I would say that this is not unexpected, Mobile County versus Bowen County, for this primary reason, that it's a more 
uh, urban uh, area. It's more population density, so you'd expect that. Um, I would say that the trends for both counties are similar. Um, so we have this divided into two different types of crimes. Crimes against people and crimes against property. So with respect to crimes against people, we see that robberies have declined over time, yet murders, rapes, and assaults have increased. And crimes against property, that second tab, again another feature of the dashboard you can toggle between them, is that we see larceny, which is theft, and burglaries have declined, yet auto theft has increased. This is interesting to me because just yesterday I saw a national poll was released, a national news organization polled uh, Americans, and the results were that se over the last year, uh, people's perceptions are that 74% of Americans feel that crime rates have increased over the last year nationally, and 54% think they have increased in their local area. So this is a key area to pay attention to, and again, we're grateful for this information. Sometimes law enforcement agencies are reluctant to release the, the data, uh, but we're glad that they were able to get it to us. So let's turn to education, and Yana? This one is a little more extensive. Um, the very first tab here is looking at basic overview of proficiency levels across different grades and different, sorry, different systems. We, there, are five, there are a total of five school systems in the two counties, public school systems, one in Bowling County and four in Mobile County. There's a, great, um, there's a great detail of information, so we try to picture it as, as best as possible, but typically students are assessed at math and reading, English in high school. So we've got two colors we're working here, math and reading or English. We've got five school systems compared to the state of Alabama, and we've got elementary school grades and then middle school. I'll switch to it later. But um, this chart, these lines basically show the trend from between two points in time. The beginning is year 2015, that's the earliest data we were able to find. That was, ass assessment is typically done at the end of the school year. So the assessment was done in probably May of 2015, of the academic year 2014-2015, and then we're comparing to when it was done in 2019. No, under normal circumstances, we would, have, we would be able to compare to 2020, but because of COVID, assessments were waived, so um, we're not going to be able to see that. But uh, we're, we're able here, to, we're, here we're able to see a quick trend, quick change between 2015 and 2019 in each, in each system, in each grade. Ideally, see increase. Little, a little star here indicates decline from 2015. And you see teal is math and reading in English is dark blue. I can switch the view to middle and high schools. We have separate grade for middle schools, but then high schools data was all combined. It's important to notice that um, the size of these systems, if you see at the top, roughly 93,000 students are enrolled in all these five school systems. That's just the average from the past five years enrollment. But you can see how large Mobile County and Bowling County is comparing to the remaining three. So that's important to keep in mind as you're evaluating um, their performance. The next tab provides very similar information, but a lot more detailed. We're able to see all the years and exact proficiency rates uh, for, each, uh, for each grade and each system for every year. So again, we're looking at rates, at percentages of students that pass the proficiency test for the given year in the given class each year in each system. Orange is bad, teal in math, or dark blue in reading and English is good. Ideally, we want to see going from dark, dark orange to more of a teal in math and dark blue as the years progress. The next dashboard looks at students, looks at proficiency among, 
comparing all students versus economically disadvantaged students. Economically disadvantaged students, and I've got a note here, Alabama State Department of Education defines economically disadvantaged students as those who qualify for free and reduced lunch and or those federally identified as homeless, foster, or migrant. Again, we've got a similar trend um, graph here. And if you hover over, there is additional information showing how different local systems rank in terms of disadvantaged students enrollment, with see Chickasaw has the most, and then the other four range between 43 and 55%. So a great portion of um, economically disadvantaged students in each system, in each grade. And so all students are gray, excuse me, all All students are gray, and blue is economically disadvantaged. Naturally, they're not performing as well. And then you can swap. Here, the, filter, the filters offer a chance to look at math and reading separately. And then you can um, look at uh, middle schools as well. Naturally, we want to see not a decline, but we would like all of them to increase and preferably economically disadvantaged students to catch up with all students. The very last one drills down a lot. Um, and here is, let me take a moment here to explain a little more. Uh, this is rather complex and we're currently looking at subject reading in English for elementary schools for all students, okay? Each horizontal bar represents a distribution of students in the given system, in the given year, this is 2019, fourth grade, and it breaks it down into four levels. Um, level one and level two students means they're considered not proficient in the given subject. Gray, level three or darker gray, level four, means they are proficient. Level four is the best, so uh, while level three means that they're proficient, there is still room for improvement for them. So as years, let's say, let's take Satsuma, as years progress from 2015 up to 2019, we want to see less orange and more gray. That's a case with some systems and some grades. And then we can do the same looking at math. We want to see less orange and more gray. And we can do the same with middle schools. And then we can drill in further and look at economically disadvantaged students. We're going to see a lot more orange there. A couple things I'll point out about our data here. It's only public school system data. That's because the Alabama Department of Education requires public school systems to report that data. We don't have any data from private or parochial school systems. We wish we did. We looked for ways to, to get a hold of that information. We were not successful. Second thing is, why the term reading and English? Because in the lower grades, reading is about reading. And as students progress, then they start to figure out what a participle is and what a semicolon is and so forth, and that's the English part. Um, I think that uh, something else that, that I would point out here is with respect to this particular dashboard and these levels, um, it would be interesting if anybody has any contacts with private school systems and if they could make this data available, uh, you may see some disparities there. Uh, that's my hunch. We had a lot of, John and I had a lot of back and forth about how to, to capture this data, about how to present it. Uh, and the last caveat I would offer you is, is that, of course, we have five systems here, Mobile County and Bowen County and three city school systems. We do not yet have data for the Gulf Shores Orange Beach uh, system. Uh, as soon as that information is reported, we'll capture it and we'll create a dashboard uh, bullet for that as well. So the next one we want to show you, uh, and it's related to this, are the number of students who take advantage of free and reduced lunch. This was a striking, striking dashboard to me personally. Um, I've never lacked for a meal. Thank, thank God for that. But a number of students do. And what you see here in um, Chickasaw, 57% of students. 
are relying on at least one meal, in most cases two, at school. In Mobile County, 52%, and Baldwin County, 48%. So this got us to wondering as we prepared this information. When those school systems shut down for COVID, if they're relying on the school systems to provide them for you know, breakfast and lunch, what were they eating otherwise? Well, happily, I can report that um, some school systems did make arrangements. Davidson High School prepared meals, had, uh, for example, and I know that I'm not just singling Davidson out, I just, that someone was telling me about this the other day. And so a number of school systems within Mobile County, and I'm, I'm so, Casey, maybe you can help me know, uh, in Baldwin County did so as well. But it's important to understand that uh, a number of our students, 93,000 students in public schools in our two counties depend, half of them depend, on those school systems to eat. It's shocking um, and it's eye-opening. Uh, and not fun to think about sometimes, but it's, as Michael said earlier, the information is what the information is and we are happy to report it. And hopefully as we um, update and report more information going forward, as this um, process spurs what it's intended to spur, and that is conversation amongst governmental, institutional, educational, and community leaders that we will look for ways to make these data points, the ones that aren't so good today, look better in the future. That's the presentation we wanted to offer you. We're happy to answer questions about uh, anything that we can answer. Um, sometimes we can't answer everything, but we're happy to, to do so. And there are additional dashboards available yes. on the website covering other metrics when you're free to explore. Okay, I'll just uh, jump in between you. Uh, any questions from the group today? I have a question. Dr. Richardson. So the data relative to the private schools as it relates to the Alabama State Department of Education, you indicated those reports hadn't been turned in yet or hadn't been received? No, the, they don't, they're not required. It's voluntary and some schools do and some schools don't. Uh, we didn't feel that it was uh, appropriate to take uh, that data that and, and to include it uh, because it doesn't represent the entire uh, population, if you will, of the private and parochial school systems. Um, but it's not required that it's all voluntary. It's fascinating that the State Department doesn't make it mandatory, but that's another conversation for another day, as you yes, said. Sir. Yes, the other sir. question I have is relative to the child mortality rates. You indicated, I think, 109% mortality, child mortality rate for the black community? Yes, sir. Mm. Uh, again, I can't tell you how uh, it happens, but I can tell you again, child mortality rates are for ages 1 through 18, and it's expressed on the basis of per 100,000 people. And so essentially the, the math is the number of, of childhood deaths divided by 100,000. Um, and, and it's uh, frightening that those are what they are. We have another that's related to this that is infant mortality, which is defined as the number of deaths of from, from birth to up to one year of age. And the data are much more um, appealing, uh, if you will, to, to look at. Uh, but as these children move farther into their lives, uh, their mortality rates do increase. And I, I can't tell you if it's because of crime or if it's because of disease or if it's because of malnutrition, we don't know the answers to those questions. I think those are questions that need to be explored uh, and, and, and hopefully um, some answers will be forthcoming. So here's the infant mortality rate. Yes. Well, there's also less yeah. people between exactly. age right. zero to one. Right. So you they're naturally small. lower. Yeah, expect lower. And the trends generally over time are down. Even the lower lows are, are lower than, than the higher highs in terms of a 10-year span. Yes. Uh, Ray, just for clarification and what Dr. Richardson asked, when we went to uh, black uh, children and uh, child mortality, that was 107 per 100,000, not 107 correct. percent, correct? Correct. Okay. That's correct, yes. Say that again, please. Yeah, when, you, when the uh, dashboard showed 107, I think your question was, is that 107 percent? Mm -hmm. And it, it, I mean, that's the highest by far of them, but it's 107 per 100,000. Yes. Thank you. Okay, we have some questions back, Jill. 
I was just curious to know if you knew what percentage of students attend private school versus public school. Uh, I don't know. Uh, we, we thought about that and w the way we can quantify it is we can look at census data to tell us how many children there are between certain ages as uh, a percentage of the overall population in both counties. And then we can take those numbers and kind of juxtapose those against the 93,000 or so that are in Mobile County public school systems and, and Baldwin and the other city schools and kind of back into a number. Uh, we had a similar conversation about the number of children who are enrolled in pre-K programs because a number of those, are, you know, pre-K is, is, is an inclusive type number. It includes those systems, those public school systems, those parochial and private school systems, as well as, you know, Mom's Day Out programs that are operated by churches and other types. So difficult for us to figure that, but we can um, report and we can certainly add some information about as a, as a, um, the number of students within those public school systems as a percentage of the overall number of students within that age. We it may not be exact, that. but it may be a good estimate. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and it gives context, and we don't have that. So it would give some context, some added context. But we did, we had a lot of discussion about how to frame it. Yeah. Over here. Hi. Um, I, I see um, several um, people in the room. We deal with economic development um, and community partnerships. And I know you didn't touch on this today, but can you give your overall assessment if you have that information so readily on how are we doing with growth, economic development, as well as how are we doing business in both of the counties? Sure, so I can tell you that I'm just gonna highlight several things. Um, certainly we see population increasing uh, in both counties. Uh, we do see population increasing uh, at a higher rate in Baldwin County in recent years. Uh, we did feature the dashboard on wages. We do see wages increasing in both counties over time, and th th those are good, good news stories. Uh, we have that, that statistic that breaks down certain wages within certain groups uh, of industries, and that's, that's a healthy thing. Um, we, we show, we have another dashboard we didn't feature today on household incomes. We see household incomes increasing, and that's a positive. Uh, one thing we didn't touch on here, but is part of quality of life, uh, is air quality and water quality. Air quality is a very difficult uh, thing to express because of the language itself. I mean, what is sulfur dioxide and what is, you know, all these different chemicals. But we, we pulled data from the United States uh, EPA and we looked at um, air quality. And I can tell you that over time, my impression when I saw the information, I was a little shocked because uh, I can remember when uh, you know, there were great employers, but paper mills, when they operated full steam here, were, were, were throwing out that particulate matter into the atmosphere every day at full, full blow. Depending on where you stood and, and which way the wind was blowing, sometimes it smelled good, sometimes it didn't. Uh, and many in this room, I can remember that. But I can tell you that, so with that in my mind, I'm thinking, gosh, maybe our air quality is not so good, but really, it's, it's really good over time, and it's got even better. Uh, water quality, I think, is another issue. What we looked at is rivers that have uh, different types of pollutants in it. Interestingly enough, um, the types of things that make water quality in terms of, of rivers and streams and bays and creeks and so forth not so good has to do with, I hate to say it, economic development, um, land development, uh, and more so in Baldwin County than in Mobile County because there's been a lot of, obviously, land development in recent years. Um, but, you know, labor force participation, I would think, be another key indicator that uh, future employers may want to look at. Uh, and uh, although our labor force participation rates show declines over time, it's not unlike what we've seen in the United States. It just suggests that of all those people 18 to 64 who are eligible to work, we have fewer as a percentage of group who choose not to. So that's an interesting metric to us. Um, household ownership is about where we figured it would be, somewhere in the low 60, 61, 2 percent range. Um, what am I missing? What am I missing? Um, I think those would be, those would be the key, key things. So, th so there's a lot of great news here. Uh, we chose to kind of start with some, some pretty good news and end on some things that we think really ought to require some attention. But there's a lot of really great news here from, from an economic development standpoint. Dr. Cummings, could you pull up the water quality and kind of sure. explain how you came sure. up with that sure. metric? I think sure. that's very interesting. Sure. So what you see here again in the lighter color blue, that's Mobile County, and the purplish uh, color here on your screen, that is Baldwin County. And each of these uh, lines in the bar charts are individual bodies of water. And so what you see here is the number of years that uh, they have been reported as having some problems. 
And so, for example, in Mobile County, uh, Cold Creek, for 24 years, it's been an issue. Um, Fish River, over in Bowen County, for 22 years, it's been an issue, and all the way down. And so some of this um, uh, information is shocking, some of it not so much. Uh, they're really, um, it ranges from 24 years to four years, those bodies of water that have been reported as troubled in Mobile County, and I think the number is 25 to 26 in Bowen County. Um, and, and look at the causes, this is what I was talking about just earlier, as it refreshes. So this gives you the kinds of things. So heavy metals, mercury is the number one cause in Mobile County, uh, and atmospheric deposition. So this is that particulate matter that I was talking about in terms of air quality. As it, uh, you know, as, as dew and as rain and, and other types of moisture uh, occurs, that stuff falls out of the atmosphere and falls into the water. Um, so that is uh, the number one cause in both Mobile and Bowen County. And in Mobile County, we have urban runoff, storm sewers, uh, as the number two largest uh, problem, and land development uh, in Bowen County. Uh, and, and so the numbers go back and forth between those, uh, but that's how the dashboard functions in terms of What I would of add data. about the water is that some of the pollutants and sources of pollutions are shared, are same for both counties, and mm -hmm. some differ. So that certainly opens up opportunities for discussion as to what do we share, right. how can we fix it together, and what do we need to um, right. work so, on, on our own. So, you know, stormwater management has always been a big issue in Mobile County for the last, you know, 25 years in terms of the real estate development world. It's been a major issue here. And I think it's becoming increasingly um, um, high on the priority list over in Bowen County. Um, sewer and sewer systems and sanitary sewer systems, uh, also their, their spill and runoff uh, issues, those are both major factors in both counties, I think. So we had one question from our online viewers. Uh, that could you give us the ratios by race that qualify for free or reduced lunch? Sure, we can. Uh, that data was not available. If it was, uh, I would have put it in there. Uh, I'm sorry. That, that, if, that data was not available. Uh, if it's available, I would have put it up there. But I, that was very inter I was interested in myself. But if it's not in the data, I'll go back and look and explore that. But as far as I remember, I worked on it a few months ago. As far as I remember, mm -hmm. that data was not available. So th that's a good point because uh, we consider this phase one of the dashboard. Uh, this, what we started in February, uh, and just to give you an, just an idea, this was done in basically a 90-day period. It's a phenomenal achievement in a very short period of time. I think we ordered, uh, you know, maybe a used bicycle to start with, and they gave us a we series. We priced it like a used bicycle too, yeah. Series, <laughs> series 300 Mercedes or something like that. So we, uh, you know, they are obviously very passionate about this project, and that's why, why it's results. But if there are data points like this, that are of interest to you in the room or online, uh, and we can find the data, uh, please let us know and we will look. Unfortunately, sometimes the data isn't broken down and we're not generating data. We're going to respected sources of where the data exists already and pulling it into this site and aggregating it. So, uh, great question. I'm sorry we don't have the information. Dr. Richardson? One, I'm thoroughly impressed and grateful for all that you guys are doing, starting out with a bicycle, looking towards a Mercedes 300. But uh, uh, the question I have is um, kind of forward thinking as you collect more data. It's obviously, well, simply put, metaphorically speaking, you know, the scriptures often say that where your heart is, there your treasures are also. So as you provide more data, it should inform those people that are in decision-making processes about how to approach these things. When you looked at that information relative to the environmental impact as related to the waterways in Baldwin County and Mobile County, you indicated 12 years, 24 years where we have these particular issues. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm just looking forward to seeing how this matures and progresses and how it will impact our decision-making as it relates to allocation of resources and dollars because I mean, at some point or another, we're following the data to start out, but we're clearly going to have to follow the money. Well, I think that's a, you're, it's a great point you make, uh, and I would say, and, and I think, and Michael touched on this earlier, um, you know, we can build a dashboard to answer a question as long as the data are available, and there's, there are probably other questions that um, could be asked, and better put, probably should be asked, uh, and if the data are there, we would like to try to do that. Uh, for example, uh, one thing that we, we do have the data for, and we looked at, and I can't remember if we included it or not, we have a dashboard here for high school graduation rates. And we don't just have it by school, but we have it broken down by uh, race, and we have it broken down by gender, and we have it broken down by, uh, those two I think we do feature, 
but we can also break it down um, by the general population, by students with disabilities, students who are deemed uh, economically disadvantaged, students who are uh, of military families, students who are um, uh, my, of children of migrant uh, families and migrant worker families. So I mean those are interesting data points and they point to a lot of other questions. So there's a lot of information out there and we certainly can fine tune and build. But we're hopeful that this would create other questions that you all can ask and say, gosh, could we ask this question? And, it, and again, my answer to that would be, uh, we can answer it if we can find the data to help us do so. And I, I, we would look forward to being involved in that process. This is what's so exciting about what we're, do, what we're doing here. And really if is. I may add, if conversations in the community uh, take place in the future about improving data collection, we'd love to contribute to that conversation because we can certainly share with you uh, some examples of what has worked really well, what has enabled us to show a great deal of detail to the community versus something uh, mm -hmm. where we were not able to do that. And so that can be used as an example for, yeah. uh, for further data collection. And, and coming back to, I think, to one of the points that you were making is, you know, uh, business licenses, business permits, housing starts, those are all indicators of forward growth. Um, and we are going to attempt to do business licenses, and here's where we could use your help. Uh, we have built a dashboard, not as part of this project, but as part of the, what we work, we do every day that looks at business licenses, not just the issuance of new business licenses, because that's important, but I know that many of the chamber folks here focus on business retention as well. And so what speaks to that? The renewal of business licenses. And then moreover, if you can take that information and break it down by zip code, then that tells you where businesses are starting and where businesses are staying. Unfortunately for us, uh, and, and Mobile County does report the business license data to us, broken out in terms of new and renewal. Baldwin County's data are aggregated and if somehow somebody could get on the phone and, and make that call to the folks that produce that data, um, we, we don't want to pound too hard, but, but if, hand in the if room. we could do that, it would be helpful. We'll, we'll work on that. Okay, so I mean, and we can easily, if you can, we would, eat, we would love to do that. In fact, we've, we've attempted to do it, uh, but, but we just don't have the information. But we think it tells a really important story, it really does, and, and to, to your economic development point. I think uh, someone on, online wanted you to flash up the, uh, I guess, the pollution levels in the various creeks and rivers in Mobile County. So that. So the upper bars. Oh, I see. Uh, ah. <laughs> Sorry. So, and so what that, that information tells you then is, is it tells you the number of years that uh, the Alabama Department of uh, um, ADEM, Alabama Department of Environmental Management, has labeled that a troubled water in terms of it being a problem with some type of the runoffs that you, the, the pollutants uh, that you've seen on that second dashboard. Did they so, ask three mile uh, creek. Three mile creek. Twelve years on the list. Now, what causes that? I don't know entirely. Uh, my guess is it's probably uh, stormwater uh, and runoff, uh, largely to that. Ah, sorry. Here we go. What causes? Yeah, here we go. Here we go. Urban runoff and storm sewers. I guessed correctly. How about that? <laughs> Shouldn't have done that live. I don't suppose. I have a question in the back of the room. Hi, thank you, great work. It's great to look at and see how far you've come so quickly. Um, building off of Dr. Richardson's question, um, have you thought about uh, developing a dashboard that looks at the question of resource allocation, specifically with regard to education? In other words, what's the local and state funding per system so that we can, can compare both outcomes and, and progress of the students, but also what kind of local resources are we putting into those, to yeah, those young people? Uh, Shannon, that's an interesting question. Uh, we haven't thought about it, but it's certainly, I think that information is available, and it's certainly something that we could add um, to probably an existing dashboard, but probably would be better suited to st on a standalone dashboard. And if further that information is broken down into not, you know, a lot of times you see information in Mobile County you spend $9,000 per public school student and in, in Baldwin County you spend whatever the number is. 
But if you could figure out what they're spending it on, that really goes more to your point, right? So um, is, it, is it to salaries? Is it to plant and equipment? Is it to programmatic uh, uh, things? Is it to free and reduce lunch? I don't know. So uh, we'll look for that. That's an interesting question. I appreciate you asking that. Hi, good morning. Hi. Um, I'm, I'm stuck on the child mortality rate. I can't stop thinking about that. It would make sense that over a lifespan, obviously, people would die as you get older, but to 18, if it gets worse, between zero and 18, that's staggering to me. So my question is, is there a group here or someone that you could suggest that would be able to do the research to talk about correlation or causation based on some of the things that you were thinking about or? Uh, good question. Uh, groups that I would think, um, uh, you know, the folks that work in the hospital systems uh, may have some data that might indicate that. Now, how, uh, not readily they would release it, but how they are able to release it in terms of reporting that information, privacy laws and so forth, that may be a, a roadblock or an issue of some, I'm not saying it is, but if, if I could think of a stumbling block. Um, we could uh, go further and ask the Alabama Law Enforcement Association if they have any information about uh, childhood mortality uh, as it relates to uh, accidents, uh, you know, um, vehicle accidents or, or crime, um, because that might really help drill in and say, why is this? Uh, I would think that uh, in terms of childhood nutrition, there are probably some groups within the state that collect that information. Uh, I'm looking at my colleague, Kandukar. We have a colleague here as well in, in the college that looks at economics from a health standpoint. Uh, and perhaps you and I, Kandukar and Irvashi, could have a conversation about finding out sources for that kind of information, because I think it would really uh, provide some additional depth and color to, to an answer to the question. It's a good question. Yes. I wanted to follow up on Shannon and Chris's question about resources. I know a lot of times when we talk about resources, we talk about financial resources, um, but also talking about the organizations, nonprofits, business organizations that respond to some of these um, in an attempt to ensure efforts aren't duplicated. A lot of agencies and organizations work on the same thing, but um, if we could get together to figure out how to best tackle the problem and pull our resources together, um, that would be, I think, something interesting to see. I agree with you. Uh, I think uh, that really is turf management, isn't it? Uh, you know, um, politics and, and, and economic development and community leaders often, there are clashes about, well, who's going to lead the charge? And my sense would be, what difference does it make as long as the charge is going in the same direction? So I would encourage that. Uh, and we'd be happy to support whatever, uh, in whatever way we can. Uh, but I, I would think that that would be helpful. So I can, I can add a comment about that. We, we didn't do this dashboard to basically present it and then identify the problems and then get input from you for us to solve all the problems, right? Thank you, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean that in a, in a sincere way, really. It, it literally is to start the conversation. Because many times you're in uh, public, public debates or issues and people are saying, things are bad, but let's look at the data. They're not. Or people say, things are okay. Well, you look at the data, they're really not okay. And it's that ability to look at the data and have a definitive answer that can make a real difference in the conversation. So we look at this as a tool. You know, we've built the hammer. I say we. Uh, Dr. <laughs> Cummings and Yana Stepovsky have, have built the hammer uh, uh, thanks to the Coastal Alabama Partnership and our partners. But it's a tool to be used. And so to the last question, I mean, in the last 48 hours, based on what they have done in this collaboration, I got a, an email from a colleague showing me a grant request that seems to kind of fit in the space. So whether it's South or whether it's a community organization that can do things like that, that's the purpose, to give us the data. And if you're from the South system or a university, you know the importance. We're very focused on trying to help underserved populations. And we, we want to do projects in that area. So this type of source, this type of tool where you can go to one place free, break it down by county, hopefully show the state average, the national average, break it down by race, gender, et cetera, it's an exceptional tool. And they've just done a fabulous job. So uh, I think this is an appropriate time to give them a round of applause. So thank you very much. Any 
any final comments? Well, I think Jan and I owe you all a round of applause as well because this is important, not just for what we did. We're, we're just a piece of the action here. This is important for everybody in this room and all the constituents that you represent. And we're just delighted that the University of South Alabama had the opportunity to be engaged in this because one of our goals as a university is to be engaged within the community. And we try to do that in everything that we do through our center. So it's not about us. It's not even about the dashboards. It's about what you all can do with these dashboards. So with that, I would just say thank you very much. And congratulations to you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. You bet. Appreciate it. You bet. All right. I have a few closing comments. I'm going to put this mic down. Uh, so you all should receive a survey shortly, whether you're here in the room with us or online. So please fill that out. Tell us how we can improve. If you have ideas on future speakers uh, or you would uh, like to become a sponsor of events, Coastal Conversations in general, or uh, the dashboard of the survey, please let us know. We're talking to a number of people in the community and really appreciate the, the momentum and support and enthusiasm that you've shown. If you have friends who were not able to join in person today or online, this presentation taped uh, will be available online uh, at the coastalcon.org uh, website under the news tab. And you can see this one, you can see the quality of life survey, you can see Chuck Marone, you can see Ron Ferguson. And as you see the people, the great team in the back of the room, they are professional production quality. So. Uh, it's, a, it's a great, great video being done that's a resource for the community. Now, I just want to briefly thank uh, some members of our team, Bester Ward III, uh, Bester IV, uh, Chris Lee, who's here with us today, the Bedsoe Foundation, uh, Wiley Blankenship, of course, I've mentioned, Andrew LeBaire is here, uh, Stacy Welburn, Kaylee Shepard, who uh, is with us at South now, uh, and Abby Lawler, who's a new member of the team. So we thank all of you guys for helping make this possible. A quick note on our next speaker. One of the things we've uh, done, what's that, Chris? What's that? Oh, did I forget Kelly? Okay, well, forget me. Where is Kelly? I'm sorry, Kelly. <laughs> you know, I can read and then I can't read, so forgive me for uh, missing that. But uh, thanks so much for your help on this project. Uh, our next speaker will be Costas Christ. And so we've done all of these virtual with the exception of today. This is kind of our first foray out into the... Uh, environment. The next one will be on June 22nd at 6.30 p.m. live, and the venue will be announced shortly. And the speaker is Costas Chris. He is kind of the father of ecotourism. So you'll see we are having different speakers on different topics. Ron Ferguson on learning disparities, Chuck Marone, urban planning, quality of life. This one is on ecotourism. Let me tell you a little bit about him. He's a former Harvard wildlife researcher, former travel writer for the National Geographic. He's credited with the first definition of ecotourism, which is responsible travel to natural areas that protects nature and sustains the well-being of local people, something that is all near and dear to our heart. Uh, he's appeared on the Travel Channel, BBC, Good Morning America, National Geographic, and Fox News, uh, and National Public Radio, and several public documentaries. Uh, what I find significant, he was honored with Dr. Jane Goodall, who I assume you all recognize, uh, at, for his efforts to protect the environment. Uh, he's been recognized on a regular basis as a tourism visionary. So please register for that event. There should be a link sent to you and available on our website shortly. Uh, and uh, we really encourage you, if you can't attend in person, it will be offered again on Facebook Live and our YouTube channel. Again, if you have ideas about future speakers or things we should do differently or sponsorship ideas, please get in touch with us. Uh, I want to thank Kelly Hope again <laughs> and uh, all the members of the team. And I really appreciate some members of the Coastal Alabama Partnership and the folks who support uh, CAP for being here today. So with that, have a great day and thank you so much for being here. Thank you.